here. Realistic, what I mean by realistic is considering transaction costs and some time dependence, which is an issue here. I'll tell you why. Uh, risk aversion, it has to be time consistent and you have to have an intuitive uh, way of determining that. And the computation tractability, basically what we do is going to use SDDP with a Markov dependence, okay? So let's go through the points. The first one, uh, let's, let's look at the basic problem here, okay? So basically what I, this is a dynamic uh, stochastic programming uh, set of equations. And the, what I want to do here is I have a, a at, let's say at the last stage, I have a bag of money. I want to allocate this bag of money in cash and some assets, okay? In the sense that I maximize some value measure or some risk measure here for the last stage, okay? And this has a recursive setting. If we have this phi as the CVAR, for example, this problem would be maximizing the nested CVAR at the last wealth, okay? So we have here our state, which is the wealth. So typically what we use on, on dynamic stochastic programming, as we see in much of the talks for hydrothermal planning, it's the convex combination of the expected value of n CVAR, which is basically uh, an average between these two points here. It is an average and a worst case measure. That's good. And we actually have uh, economic interpretation for that, which is a paper that I have with uh, Birgit Hudloff at Street that was here, and had to leave. So, and which is a, a certain equivalent, right? That's good, but there is another issue. How should we define lambda? Imagine that we we're talking to a hedge fund manager. What is your lambda? And then the guy says, what is the lambda? Can you explain to me? Okay, let's try. You go to your last period, then you try to uh, have a weighted average between your worst case and the average. Then you go back and you do a composite thing with this. So what's your lambda? And the guy will say, what? So it's not, it's not even clear how to define the lambda that reflects your risk aversion, right? So the first point here is let's try to uh, introduce risk aversion in an intuitive and still time consistent manner. So our proposal here is a very simple. We stayed with the expected value in the objective function, the same as the last one, and we include a risk constraint, which is basically uh, the, your return for one period has to be, your loss at one period has to be bounded by some proportion of your wealth. And that I, I, can, I can actually ask for a fund manager. How are you willing to lose? Okay, I'm willing to lose 1% a day. That's intuitive, and that we can get, okay? So this problem has some properties, right? First of all, we have an intuitive risk averse parameter. Second, this problem has relative complete recourse if this parameter here is positive, non-negative, actually. This is actually good for us because for the SDDP algorithm, we don't have to worry about feasibility cuts. It's just, it's always feasible, okay? And the last one is you, f you can look at the problem. It has all of the right-hand side is scalable by the, uh, W, which means this can be positively homogeneous. We can prove this. And this actually, we can, from this, we can actually prove that this problem with no transaction costs and no time dependence is actually myopic. That when we solve, uh, to solve the multi-stage problem, it's simply the same thing as solving a one-period problem where we maximize the expected value of the wealth at the next day with your uh, uh, constraints for one period, okay? This has the same uh, solution. That's okay, let's go forward. So to include some more realistic assumptions, let's go for transaction costs. Transaction costs, uh, the problem 
uh, has some additional uh, variables and constraints, which are basically uh, now we have our state, which is not mo anymore a bag of money, and it's a vector that we have how much money do I have in each account or in each stock, for example. So this is our state, it's a vector. And then we have some uh, balance constraints, basically what I had plus what I bought minus what I sold. And some cash constraints that where we pay the transaction costs. Okay? So we adapt the risk constraint here and for uh, certain values of gamma, which is uh, considering also the, the transaction cost, this is, has also relative complete, complete recourse. It has also a feasible solution. But there is a question. Why did you change the state here? I mean, X and W, you can migrate from one to the other. It's easier to write the equation? No, because with transaction costs, I need to know if I have all my money in Petrobras, so I don't, I, the other one, I, if I have a bag of money, I can always re reallocate. So, so moving from the, now we have this vector uh, state problem, and we, we can move forward. So just to simplify the notation now, we can see this previous problem which, with these constraints, we can model as a control problem which we have like a maximization, some control variables, which is my buying and selling decisions. And we have a value function that uh, we have our state here, which is how much I, I have in each account, which depends on how much I buy and how much I sell. And then we, have, we can look at this very simple uh, notation here, which is the same problem we had there, okay? Note that in, in this set here is my risk constraint. I could I can put it all here because it's a one period constraint. And it, so if we look at here, it looks like a risk neutral problem, but it's not because we have a risk constraint. And then this is time consistent, okay? So how do we solve this, this problem with transaction costs? The stochastic dual dynamic program does the trick. And it does the tricks, why? Because we also assuming time independence. Why this, is this important? Because uh, our value function here is the same independent of which node we are in the tree because of time independence, right? This is good, we can share cuts. That's the, the trick of the STDP. However, if we have a general time dependence, so STDP doesn't work. Uh, in the planning problem, people use the linear dependence on the right-hand side. And that can be handled. But for a generic time dependence, that's not true. So SDP doesn't work with a generic time dependence, right? To do a generic time dependence, we have to go to our traditional banders decomposition. We have to decompose the whole tree, which doesn't scale as much as the stochastic dual dynamic program, okay? So basically, in this case, we would have a different value function for each node of the tree and that's basically solving the whole tree and not sampling as the STDP does. So what we are proposing here is to actually use a Markov dependence. So basically we, ha we would have some uh, market states, let's say a bull, a bull state, bull market state or a bear market state. And from that we have given a state, we have a stage-wise independent uh, returns for our assets, okay? So then we can actually model our value function ex as the maximization of the expected value of our last wealth, okay? So then this is a, a, the expected value given the state at time t plus one uh, times the probability of, of being in that state conditioned to my state today. Okay, so basically that's the, uh, the expected value if we have a Markov dependence process, okay? So moving on. Looking at the picture, what exactly we're doing here, if we don't, we're not on the first uh, assumption, which is time independence, we're not on the second, which is a general dependence, 
we have some structure on dependence. So basically what we have is we have a value function for each state. And basically this is what we are doing depending where we are. We are actually weighting these two uh, value functions depending if we are in a bull market. We have, uh, for example, a high probability of a good value function and a low probability of a bad value function. And or on a bear market that would be uh, the opposite. This type of uh, trick it was done in the electrical and the hydrothermal uh, problem by Vitor and Philpot, and we could we bring to the asset allocation problem so that we can model the uh, dependence on the asset returns. Let's remember that asset returns in our problem here is on the left hand side. It could be non-linear and it's on the left-hand side. Typically, w w on the SCDP, you have a linear dependence on the right-hand side, which makes things more difficult. So, uh, said that, let's look at some uh, empirical results. Uh, what we're going to do here is actually uh, a case for Brazil. We are actually trying to invest on uh, gold, stocks, dollar, or euro, okay? And we have also cash. We, we have also to think that we have cash, which is a risk-free asset. For us, let's remember that the risk-free asset is like 14% a year, okay? So all, all our testing here is excess returns. So to have more than 14% a year, you really have to have good bets on the market, right? It's really difficult to, to beat that, this risk-free asset. So uh, for our testing, we have four states, okay? We have a uh, 0.05% uh, transaction. It's 0.5% transaction cost. Yes, there's an additional zero here. Uh, our CVAR is 9%. And our constraint here is actually also wrong. This is a... a we have a 2% limit loss on one day uh, allocation, okay? Uh, what we do here, we, have, we run an SDP for 10 days, we plan ahead 10 days, and then we implement that and we use that, uh, the estimates for the value function for 10 days, and we, when we get there, we actually re estimate the whole thing and do a slide window to do a back test and see if this is, has some uh, if it's useful, you can gain some money on this, okay? So let's check the, the results. Our, our benchmark is the very, very simple strategy which is equal weighted. We pick every asset, one over an N. That's the uh, blue line here. This is a benchmark that was tested by De Miguel. It's, a, it's also a difficult benchmark to beat. So we, in, we are looking here at uh, cumulative re excess returns of the portfolio, okay? So let's look uh, at the, our portfolio here. We start with some bad bets. We lose some money, but at some point, the equal weight uh, goes bad and we can hold the ground here and goes better at the end. So if that's comparable, compar compared to the equal weighted, right? If we look to the other benchmark, which is the myopic uh, version of this, which the myopic version of this is basically solving a one period problem in, with a slide window, okay? So it basically has this more or less the same shape as the dynamic one, but it's always a little worse. So we have a gain on doing the SDP for the, the planning uh, of the future policy, okay? That's one result. The second one, this, this portfolio, this uh, graphic is, is the following. Imagine that we, you put the money on this fund six months ago. The return for six months is the first point on this graph. It's actually, here it, it should be minus 5%, okay? And then move one year. Now look at six months ago and see that's the second point on this graph. 
So basically, this graph should show uh, some kind of consistency over time of the performance of this fund, right? So basically, if we look of all the points, uh, the six month return we have here, most of the time we are above the benchmark. Just in the beginning, we, we didn't win, okay? And the, the other interesting thing is actually the, using the SDDP instead of using the myopic version, we have always, all, I could say always, some gain. So we could, can, if we plan the whole thing dynamically, it has value when compared to the myopic solution, okay? Of course, here's in, here we have a, a more realistic uh, version of the problem, which is has transaction costs and some time dependence modeled by the Markov uh, model, okay? Uh, just to look at some of the allocation he did, this is uh, blue is cash, so it stayed stopped, and then he made a bet on, on dollar or US dollar. It was not a good bet, it, it went down, and then he started uh, betting on euro, cash again with some gold, I don't know why, but he put in some gold, and then we have a, a, a a portfolio of currencies, which is a uh, dollar and euro. Okay, so basically that's the preliminary results we have. I uh, tried to make it fast because it's 20 minutes pre happy hour. So, and what we did, just uh, saying here, we have a, a dynamic asset allocation, which is realistic, uh, s flexible. Time consistent where we have an intuitive loss parameter and that it, this is actually computationally tractable. Okay, that's it. Okay. Thank you very much. We can have uh, one question before.